I now look to Vidika Rastogi, our um, ethnic minorities officer, to close the case for the proposition. Thank you, Madam President, for the incredible opportunity to speak in this historic chamber. The opposition tonight has presented salient points, and I'm honoured to speak among you all. However, I still believe that we can go to Mars, and I believe that the idea that we need to support developing nations is not in conflict with going to Mars. I believe that this is something that can be included in our plan, and we can help developing nations out. Um, the motion leaves three questions to be answered. The first being why we need to consider populating Mars. The second, why Mars is a suitable alternative. And the third is the positive impact of this motion, of this move, sorry. I want to emphasize that it is essential. We realize that this is so, not solely about whether billionaires ought to go to Mars. We are not trying to create another Monaco. Instead, whether we, you and me, can create a future there for generations yet to come. Although I'm not entirely sure that spending Thursday nights in debating chambers is the most conducive to population efforts. <laughs> More importantly, the motion needs to be caveated by stating that this effort to populate Mars requires union among all nations, as this co collective decision will impact us all. This might seem idealistic, but I think we can prevent a space race and work together as nations to move to Mars. As a classicist, I'm always eager to make my degree seem more relevant than it actually is. Um, I want to begin by discussing civilizations. Great civilizations are not murdered, but rather they kill themselves. I know this sounds incredibly extreme, but these words, these words by the historian Toynbee underline the central premise that civilizations have a choice. They either have to evolve or they can become extinct. Therefore, to secure a future for humanity, it's imperative that we evolve. And I believe that, move, that populating Mars is one way to do this. By Michio Kaku's estimation using the Kardashev scale, which, measure, which measures whether we can use and store all of the energy available to us on this planet, we still have not reached type one status. Namely, we cannot use and store all of the energy we have available on this planet. This presents a problem. NASA predicts that use of 70 to 90% of existing resources would most likely lead to an over a five degree Celsius temperature increase for over 10,000 years. The exacerbation of climate change faster than we can deal with it poses a threat to health, security, and the global economy. No one will be immune from this. However, it is undeniable that those in developing countries will be disproportionately affected. In order to fulfill our energy needs, we must look elsewhere, space. A report carried out last September notes that there is 100 times more solar energy available from a narrow strip around the Earth at geostationary Earth orbit than the forecast global energy demands of humanity in 2050. A project is already underway by the US military, which will be completed by 2025. Arachne, which it aims to deliver a space-based solar power to military bases. This initiative points to how climate change can be ameliorated and provides insight into how exploring extraterrestrial regions can produce solutions. In addition, Mars has resources such as natural minerals, which can be used as building blocks of society. One opposition to this motion that comes up repeatedly is that we should pool all our resources to focus on tackling climate change on Earth, instead of investing time and resources into populating Mars. This just seems short-sighted and does not prepare us for the prospect of Earth's possible collapse. Furthermore, by the same token that we ought to do all in our power to resolve climate change, we have the same obligation to ensure alternative security. This obligation will not be felt the same for me, the opposition, or for you all tonight. 
Inspired by last night's karaoke event, I want to echo the words of the Beach Boys. Let's avoid an ecological aftermath. <laughs> the premise that environmental changes will harm the future if we do not act has been highlighted continually throughout this evening. However, this has an ethical component, which I believe has been unexplored so far. That involves in ensuring a future and ensuring that all, throughout all nations progress is made. I believe the West also has a responsibility to ensure that developing countries are not left behind in this mission. Countries such as India in 2020 had adult mortality rates as high as approximately 31 deaths per 100 people. Their priority simply is not climate change, but rather focusing on the day to day. The West, this house, must take on this responsibility to secure a future for humanity. The time has, has come not to ask what Earth can do for you, but what you can do for the Earth and humanity in general. We live in a society where it seems that there is more to divide you and me than there is to unite us. However, this em the emphasis on this mission as a global one has the possibility to unite. Space in the past has unified people. From 1969 and the first man to, on the moon to the Blue Origin flight last summer, Regardless of political and religious beliefs, or in the union, slate loyalties, I think we can all agree that there is supreme beauty in watching an event such as a rocket launch, a reflection of mankind's achievement and innovation, but also it shows how much further we have to go. Members of the House, I present a chance to spark innovation and explore new frontiers. By only thinking of today, please do not lose sight of tomorrow. Vote proposition.